Thanks for letting me know. Yeah. Uh, so, right. so will we uh, start to talk about the plug band without any uh, dispersion? Although here we can still draw this band in the energy and momentum space. So we can notice that all the states here are degenerate, right? So they uh, form a degenerate um, quantum mechanical manifold. And we know from quantum mechanics that if we have a degenerate manifold, we can uh, perform linear uh, superpositions of the wave function and we still get the Eigen wave function of the original Hamiltonian. So as a result, um, the flat bands can have both K space and uh, real space Eigen wave functions. And uh, the uh, real space Eigen wave function, uh, the, the minimum uh, real space Eigen wave function, so minimum meaning uh, minimum in size, is uh, often called the compact localized states uh, for the flat band states. So um, we are going to base uh, a lot of our discussion of the flat band on this uh, so-called compact localized states. <coughs> and uh, the second um, comment I want to make here is that since uh, there's a lot of uh, states that's, uh, that's degenerate here, if we add even a small interaction into the manifold, uh, we can expect a lot of um, a strong effect. So um, this makes our flat end uh, systems a, a really nice platform to study interaction uh, driven physics. Um, right. And uh, the third comment I'm listing here is that uh, a sort of a trivial way of making a, a band flat is to simply uh, kill the hopping between the different lattice sites and uh, we have this um, um, isolated atomic states and I'd like to mention that this is not uh, the kind of uh, uh, flat band we are uh, going to focus on today and uh, uh, hopefully it will become more clear as we go along. Right. So uh, the last uh, remark I want to make here is that um, in real materials there is always going to be a small uh, dispersion on top of uh, the, the flat bands, right? And uh, when we are referring a band to be flat, uh, we are uh, talking about it with respect to some other energy scales in the system, could be electron-electron interaction or electron phonon interaction or, and, and et cetera. Right. So those are some general statements about the flat band. And, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, theoretically, uh, finding a flat band on the lattice was a sort of an old problem. And uh, here I'm showing you one of the earliest examples of uh, um, finding a flat band on a lattice model that was uh, uh, that can be date dated back to the 1980s. So it's uh, more than 30 years <laughs> uh, ago from now. So uh, this plot on the left, which looks a bit overwhelming, is the original illustration of the uh, the, the so-called dice lattice in this paper. And uh, um, you can see that the lattice looks a little bit like the rolling dice look, looking from the diagonal direction. And therefore, it's, uh, it's called the dice lattice. I, I think it's not called dice lattice in this original paper, but it was, uh, the name was, uh, was uh, was given later. Right. So, um, right. So the the model itself uh, may look a little bit uh, artificial as a purely two-dimensional model. And one way of uh, implementing this uh, in the actual uh, in implementing this is that you can imagine uh, putting the different atoms here uh, with different colors on different heights, as as uh, as shown here. And uh, this could uh, be one way of uh, realizing a dice lattice in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the space. Okay. Right. So what's, uh, what's uh, um, most surprising is that uh, if you solve the tight binding Hamiltonian on this lattice, you can find a flat dispersionless uh, band across the entire drilling zone at zero energy. Right. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, very easy to mistaken those as a, as a zero line of this plot, but it is not. It's just it's a it's a it's a flat band. Uh, it's a band that has no uh, energy dispersion, and it's just happened to be uh, located at zero. 
So uh, here I want to just uh, show you a little bit more about uh, the, the, the real space eigenwave function of, uh, of the flat band on the dice lattice to give you a flavor of, uh, of what's essential uh, in, in getting those uh, flat bands. So uh, this illustration here is taken from a more modern literature uh, from the group of uh, Leon Balance. And you can see that there's a snowflake um, here is the uh, compact, a compact, uh, compact eigenwave function of, of, uh, of the flat band on the dice lattice. Uh, you you will have um, um, you you have the wave function evenly distributed on, among those uh, six different sites, and uh, uh, as you go along the loop, uh, the sign of the wave function would uh, would change uh, between the neighbors. So uh, that's the, the real space with, uh, eigenwave function. And you can wor work out that uh, starting from this wave function, if we try to, um, uh, if we, <coughs> if we try to hop out from this region, you can uh, work out that any attempts um, would, uh, would, uh, um, would be accompanied by a destructive interference, meaning that uh, any hopping from the neighboring sites uh, to to a third site would be of equal amplitude and opposite sign, and therefore uh, they would uh, uh, exactly cancel out and destructively interfere with each other. And as a result, uh, this, uh, this uh, wave function is uh, strictly localized. So, um, right, and, uh, and you can imagine uh, this, uh, this Egon wave function across be distributed across the entire lattice and then form the, the, the flat band manifold. Right. So uh, the key here is that you would have a lat lattice model that supports this uh, destructively interfering um, wave function as the as the um, localized uh, wave, uh, localized eigenstates. So in the following, let's spend some time on looking at uh, looking at uh, more systematically what kind of lattice would uh, would support <coughs> this kind of uh, destructively interfering um, wave functions, and, and then give us the flat bands. Right. And another comment I want to make here is that uh, here uh, you can see that this uh, wave function is uh, clearly different from the real space uh, from, from the atomic limit, and, uh, and and sometimes I would picture this as the sort of a standing wave uh, that's uh, that leaves only on the on on the on the loop here. Cool. Um, so here I want to uh, give you a few more examples of the known uh, flat band lattice, flat band supporting lattice models, uh, together with uh, a rough time scale of uh, when they were first discussed. So uh, here, uh, you can, uh, here is the dice lattice we just looked at, and uh, uh, there's a, um, and, and here is the so-called leap lattice, which is is basically a square lattice with additional sides on the on the bounds of the square lattice, right? And uh, uh, here you can this uh, decorated square lattice with additional hopping path um, labeled by the uh, those uh, those additional lines that can also support flat bands. And here uh, we are <coughs> looking at the Kagoma lattice, which is composed of these uh, red 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 uh, vertices and, and the bonds in between. Right. And uh, here is a checkerboard lattice, uh, which um, we'll uh, come back later. And not only the flat band can be uh, found in uh, crystalline lattices, as uh, we have seen up to now, it can also be found in, um, in the Perros lattice, which, um, which can which can be found in quasi crystals. It's a quasi periodic uh, structure. And uh, uh, this is a more exotic example of a hyperbolic lattice uh, that can support flat bands. So it's a little bit hard to find uh, this in, um, in crystalline materials, but you can imagine using uh, ar the artificial lattices uh, made of. Uh, um, uh, 
made of, for example, superconducting circuits <laughs> or, or, or photonic, um, photonic element uh, to, to, to build uh, these uh, flat band supporting hyperbolic lattices. Right. So, um, so despite uh, the, uh, the uh, varieties of lattice models I'm showing you that's uh, known to support flat bands, so most of them can be actually uh, categorized into two main, uh, main categories. So, uh, so those are uh, basically the two different approaches I want to show you uh, that you can make uh, flat band using, using lattice models. So the first kind is the so-called line graph lattices. And uh, uh, in the, the Kagoma lattice, the hyperbolic lattice we just saw, and the checkerboard lattice uh, all fall into this category. And uh, um, the second type is a, a special kind of uh, bipartite lattice, which uh, you actually need to have a different number of atoms in the two sub lattices of this bipartite lattice. And uh, um, the Leap lattice, Dice lattice, and Penrose lattice we have just seen all, falls, uh, all fall into the second category. So uh, both of these uh, concepts are, are sort of uh, borrowed from the field of the, um, the mathematical field of the, of the graph theory. And uh, we'll spend some time looking at what they mean uh, respectively. So, okay. And also a side note I want to make here is that um, uh, our discussion uh, here is limited uh, to S orbital models uh, with uh, the nearest uh, with a very uh, with a very simple hopping network, uh, which means that all the bounds we are drawing here has the uh, same hopping amplitude. And uh, obviously this is um, um, th this this is not a, a a perfect uh, description of real materials. But what we hope is that um, uh, this can, by looking at those uh, simple S orbital based nearest neighbor uh, models, uh, we can uh, get a good start in understanding the essential uh, physics uh, physics pictures. Cool. Um, so. Uh, Let's uh, let's go to the the, the first part. Um, what are and, and I'll, I'll I'll use these uh, illustrations to to just um, um, explain what, what is a line. So um, a line graph can be can be defined uh, for an arbitrary uh, graph, and uh, the essential elements of a, of a graph is uh, as the ver vertex and the lines in between the vertices. Right, so uh, here uh, we start uh, from, from this uh, graph and uh, um, I'll call it the original graph and some, sometimes people call it the root graph. So how to get uh, the line graph of this, uh, this graph? So uh, the first step is, uh, is to draw a new verte a vertex on each of those lines. And uh, uh, the rules of uh, whether uh, we will connect uh, the new blue vertices is that if the um, if the bounds that's uh, of the original graph represented by each of these uh, blue vertices was uh, connected through a vertex a red vertex of the original graph, <laughs> uh, we would connect uh, uh, the two ver vertices. Otherwise, we won't uh, we won't do anything. Right, so uh, following this rule, uh, we would connect this line because uh, this and this are connected and we'll connect this as well. And uh, here as well, because these two bonds are connected and, uh, uh, and you can connect this line here and this line here as well. So uh, the final result of the line graph of this original graph is here um, where um, you can see it's, a, it's basically a, Two, two uh, edge shear triangles, right? So uh, it's a it's a sort of um, um, a way of, uh, of it's basically a graph of uh, of how how things are connected in the so, in the original graph. Yes. So going yes. back to the previous lecture, yep. the duality. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 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 
Okay, uh, where am I? <coughs> cool. Okay, so so that's a line. That's what a line graph is, right? And uh, uh, so the line graph lattices refers uh, to uh, a certain uh, kind of lattices, which uh, can be a line graph of some other lattices. Right. For instance, uh, the the Kahneman lattice is a line graph lattice. And uh, the original graph of the Kagama lattice is the is the honeycomb lattice, and we can see uh, we can we can follow the the process uh, we can follow the the process. So uh, if we start from the honeycomb lattice and uh, we uh, would uh, represent each of the bonds with a new vertex uh, that's colored in blue, and uh, because uh, these bonds are um, would so all the bonds in the honeycomb lattice would uh, intersect as at these uh, 120 degree um, degree bonds, and uh, we will result in uh, triangles um, at that's uh, with at, at where the original atoms are. Right. So as a result, uh, we uh, if we connect uh, all the uh, the new new atoms. Um, in the in the correct way, we would get this uh, corner shared network of uh, triangles, and that's our uh, Kagome lattice. And uh, um, so, uh, not only the line graph lattices can exist in two dimension, it can also exist in the uh, three dimension. And uh, um, so, this is how you get the uh, parallel lattice uh, from drawing the <coughs> the line graph of the diamond lattice. So um, in this case, uh, each of the original bonds intersects at, uh, at these uh, four, four bonds would intersect at each of the original atoms, and you will get different events um, in, in the line graph. And as a result, we get um, a, a network of corner shared uh, tetrahedrons in, in the power core lattice, which is the three dimensional uh, line graph of the diamond. Diamond lattice. Right. So, uh, so the going back to two D uh, for the uh, square lattice, we can also draw a line graph. And uh, um, so here, at, so the black lines are a uh, square lattice, and we uh, start with uh, drawing new new vertices along all the square bonds. Right. And uh, um, not only uh, you can work out them, so, so you need to connect. Those vertices, but also we need to connect uh, these two because uh, they are also connected. So intersection, and as a as a result, um, we get um, a relatively complicated uh, network. And this square here uh, with uh, with cross crossing bonds, with crossing bonds can be sort of uh, viewed as a projection of a of a of a tetrahedron. So this is how you get the checker, the so-called checkerboard lattice, and uh, it's a it's a line graph of the, the square lattice. Right. Oh yes. I don't know line graphs too well. So do all line do these all do they do they all have flat bands or do they have to be the dual to a bipartite? Uh, I think they all have. Yeah, the checkerboard is best. I think so. I'm pretty sure. At least for the for the other kinds, you don't need the bonds to be all the same distance to have these so like the line graphs to the bond graph is what's the principle um, so I, I'm probably not gonna prove it today, uh, but I I guess I, I would think about it. That's it, it supporting this destructively interfering uh, wave functions. But the amplitudes have to be the same. Yes, yes, I, I think so. I, I, I think the amplitude has to be the same. Okay. <laughs> any, any other questions? <clears throat> yes. 
sure I'm new to this. What do we care about? All right, so that's a great question. So <laughs> this is why we care. <laughs> so okay. so uh, uh, one can actually prove that uh, if uh, we have a, a lattice that's a line graph, uh, you can you can uh, work out that it always has a flat band at the energy of two t. So uh, again, I'm not going to uh, go into the the proof today, but I, I'll give you some pictures of uh, how to think about those uh, flat bands. So that right. So so that's the the um that, that's why we're we're looking at uh, line graphs here. So uh, here uh, I'm showing you the uh, the simple type binding um, dispersions of the uh, Kagome and the pyrochore and the the checkerboard lattices. So uh, you can see that um, uh, a common a common place across all the span dispersions. Is that you always have a flat a dispersionless band at a 2t um, here. So, um, right, so here I, I wanted to give you a picture of uh, what's, yeah, go ahead. So, in these line graphs, are the, so in this tight binding, have any problem yet? Are all the hopping elements the same? Uh, yes, no, that's okay. the, the if that's this. If they're different, we may not get a flat. Uh, correct. Yeah. So that that's a simplification here. Uh, more questions? Yes. Yes. But yes. So interestingly, these flat bands are never isolated. They always have a flat band. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Feature of these line graph lattices, or are they peculiar in them? Um. Um. I guess I need to check. Oh. Probably yes, and uh, I think if you break the symmetries of some of those line graphs, you might be able to separate the um, the flat band from from the other bands. Any? Oh. <laughs> okay. Is that graph also a line graph? Is a different graph from the other graph? It's a different from. Does the theorem only get one? I think technically you can define a line graph for any a network. So uh, I, I think so as long, but it, it's going to become more and more complicated if you keep drawing those bonds and uh, maybe less and less and more artificial <laughs> would become. Is there a theorem that tells you any both? I mean, you can always subtract T or whatever to give the thing uh, mm -hmm. zero. So, is there a theorem that says how many zero nodes? Um, there's. Um, I mean, you could clearly you can take an arbitrary graph, which is not a purely the duty of things. Um, I need to check that part. So I can. <laughs> Just to clarify, these are the exact flat band and not do not cover the whole thing. Um, they cover the the um, so if you have a two D model, they cover the two two dimensional grid. No. They, they they do cover the entire grid. <laughs> yes. What happens if you take a lot of power from the line? The line graph of, of the line. Um, I think you still get flat bands. It's just we get too many lines. <laughs> but they're not going to be. Um, I'm sorry, but let's. Uh, I didn't get the second but part. Are they going to be? I'm going to tell that. Um, it might be a case by case discussion. Well, cool. any other questions for, for this part? Uh, yep. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so um, said I'm, I'm not going to prove that, uh, prove that others uh, um, that the theorem here, but I, I would really love to show you the picture of, um, of looking at um, why, why there are flat bands. Right. So uh, we refer back to these uh, compact localized states. So this is the, uh, the 
compact localized state of the carbomolatus. So here are the uh, the the sites that's colored uh, yellow and red has echo amplitude of the wave function, but they have opposite signs. So uh, it's, a, it's a, a similar loop state with what we have uh, seen in the, in the previous uh, in the previous example of the of the dice lines. So uh, here you have this uh, the uh, the same loop state, and you can work out that this uh, is a self-trapping wave function and uh, uh, it cannot hop out from this region because of the destructive interference. So there's one for each, each uh, node of the original. One zero mode for every node of the original. Um, that is, you make the line graph. Or... Let me see, a uh, kind of, yeah. I think, I think it's probably fair to say that the size of this compact uh, localized wave function is comparable to the the count of the how many independent yes um i think so i, I think there is uh so, so um so this is only for uh, cases where you have s wave no, that's right. yes. Yeah, there are examples in semiconductors where it's a T wave. Right, so, so and, yeah, in but, mm -hmm. like They also have flat bands. Right, so, so, values, but they are not linearly independent. So they are over complete. Right, so in some sense, it, it's, uh, so, so maybe, it's a related question. So maybe going back to. Uh, uh, the, the earlier question. So, yeah. if you put one state here, and uh, there, there's a, there could be another state that has a slight overlap. Here. And I, I think, if my, uh, I, I think, in my understanding, uh, there is the the representation is complete, and uh, uh, we have a um, a loop state that's at the boundary of the sample. <laughs> Maybe I'm not, not explaining it very well. Um, it forms a complete basis with one um, one loop state at the boundary of the sample. But maybe it's probably different from your question. Yeah, the other case I thought that people have you know, there too they were they look like hexagonal lattices, but they are over complete. Yeah, so, so there's one on the boundary. Yeah, I, I think so. I can add a comment for the particular example of the carbon mm -hmm. uh, If you count the unit cell and there are n minus one in independent uh, hexagon plaquette uh, <laughs> of the wave function and the two more of uh, that going to the uh, like straight line across the uh, from the left to right and the other boundary from the top to bottom. Um, that counts uh, in total of n plus one state, which gives you the generous here, the gamma. Actually, one more comment. I think when there's a band touching, what you get is lots of these localized states, which do not totally span the band. And you need some delocalized state to complete the yeah. mm. basis. But when there's band touching, does this should work on a not a uh, any, any, uh... um, I think there's a question on this Zoom, but I, I don't know which computer to get. We can cover that during the training. All right, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so, <laughs> right. Yeah, so, so anyway, so that, that's the compact look, which is the minimum localized state here. And uh, uh, you can find, you can work out this uh, uh, destructively interfering compact localized state for the other uh, two line graph lattices we looked at today. So uh, for the checkerboard lattice, uh, this is the, um, the uh, wave function where um, you have, it's a four-site loop state 
and you can work out that um, the copying from from any of the pairs would uh, cancel each other out. For the um, for the particle atoms, it's a little bit hard harder to draw in the three dimension, but uh, you can find a similar loop. That I believe in this case the minimum wave function is also a hexagonal loop, and uh, it's a sort of a three dimensional version. So what's shown here? Okay, cool. So uh, hopefully um, I uh, give you a sense that. Um, you know, if you have a line graph lattice, uh, you will uh, have this uh, flat band at two t, and, and also <coughs> there, there's one one more comment that um, if you work out the uh, hopping within the loop itself, it will uh, be the source of the energy two t because it's the sort of anti-bonding states across the loop. So uh, let's move on to the to the second. Um, Second approach of uh, make, making flat band using lattice models. So uh, here, um, I just want to uh, re remind you the, the definition of a bipartite lattice, um, which uh, refers to the lattice lattices that can be divided into uh, two <coughs> different uh, sub lattices, and uh, and after the division, um, there's uh, no intra sub lattice hopping. Right. So a very simple um, example of a bipartite lattice is the, uh, is the honeycomb lattice model, where uh, we can have the um, A and B sub lattices uh, colored in red and the blue here. And uh, uh, in the nearest neighbor tight binding model, we only have uh, bonds in between the uh, atoms with different colors and, uh, and uh, um, this gives us a bipartite lattice because there's no uh, intra sub lattice hopping. There's only inter sub lattice hopping. So uh, here uh, we have equal numbers of uh, atoms in the A and B sub lattices in the in the honeycomb lattice, and we, we don't have a flat band in the honeycomb lattice. But if we go to uh, a special kind of uh, bipartite lattice that has uh, different numbers of um, of uh, atoms in the two uh, sub lattices, such as uh, the leaf lattice, and which um, you can work out that there are uh, twice as many um, blue atoms as the red here. Right? And uh, also uh, the, the dice lattice, you can you can work out that um, there's also twice as many of the the blue um, atoms as the red. And uh, uh, for the Penrose lattice, it's also a bipartite lattice with different number of atoms in the sub lattices. And uh, I, I haven't figured out what's the exact ratio, but um, it's, uh, it's actually um, relatively easy to work out that there are more uh, red atoms than the blue atoms. Right. So uh, for those lattices, there is a um, Theorem that the um, that you can always find a compact localized wave function that has the um, has energy zero. So therefore, uh, you would always have a flat band at a zero energy. And uh, um, so let me see. <coughs> so this is the uh, band dispersion of the leaf lattice and the dice lattice. Uh, where you can find this uh, this flat band state at zero energy, and I, I couldn't find uh, the um, uh, illustration of the band dispersion in the Penrose lattice due to difficulties in defining the brilliance on in a quasi um, quasi uh, <coughs> quasi periodic system, but uh, you can actually work out that the um, the energy of this compact localized state is zero because um, there's no direct hopping um, connecting uh, these sites with uh, with finite amplitude. So it's a, the same in the leaf and dice lattice case where uh, it's sort of a non-bonding state of, uh, of uh, between the sites and therefore the, um, the energy of those uh, localized wave functions are, are zero. And 
But nevertheless, the, the destructive interference uh, is uh, still at play. And uh, you can work out that, for example, these two sides would destructively interfere with each other, and uh, um, these two with each other, and uh, give um, a similar, um, similar um, localized state. So uh, I'd like to uh, summarize this part. Uh, we have uh, uh, basically visited uh, two different ways <laughs> of, uh, of uh, systematically uh, making flat bands using lattice models. So either uh, through uh, lattices that are line graph graphs of uh, some, some other uh, networks, or uh, through a certain type of bipartite lattice, which has a different number of atoms in their um, in their uh, two um, sub lattice systems, right? And uh, um, a small difference between the two is that um, uh, the, okay, the the and and, and so both of those uh, uh, lattices are based on those uh, uh, low, comp compact localized state that has this uh, destructive interference. And a, ver a small difference between the two is that uh, in the first case, those, uh, those sites are connected uh, by a hopping path. This gives them an energy of 2T, uh, while in the second case, it's sort of a non-bonding state and uh, uh, the flat band would uh, exist at energy of zero. So um, any uh, questions? Uh, before we move on to the materials part, I guess we had a lot of discussions during the talk already. something I'm uh, not discussing here today, I guess. Um, cool. So uh, let's uh, go into some materials. And uh, um, I guess I need to accelerate a little bit. And so... Um, yeah. Oh, that's a great question. So I haven't touched on this. Uh, uh, haven't touched on this, and uh, I believe for some of those uh, flat band, if you start including spin optic coupling, um, you can start uh, giving some topological characters for the flat bands. Um, so uh, I guess uh, we have a largely a uh, theorist domain. Uh, can, can I ask how, how many of, the, of you guys are, are theorists? <laughs> okay. It's a, 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 <laughs> okay, it's, a, it's a basically the majority of the uh, of the audience. So uh, I, I hope uh, before I go into the materials, I actually I uh, hope to take this opportunity to uh, maybe introduce you to a few different tools um, I use uh, to to at least I find very helpful in. Um, helping uh, me understand the, the uh, crystal structures of real materials. So if you are already uh, used to looking at materials uh, yourself, uh, what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes, um, might um, you might know everything, but just just in case it would be useful for some of us who who's never aware of these tools. So. Um, so since we care very much about the lattices, the underlying lattices of given materials, so the crystal structure is one of the key aspects of, uh, of, um, of the materials we care about here. So one of the most important uh, source of information of uh, crystal structures for given materials is this uh, inorganic crystal structure database. And uh, it's currently hosted by uh, 
both institute, both uh, this institute at Germany and also NIST. Right. So it uh, includes uh, extensively um, most of the experimentally reported inorganic uh, crystal structures as new uh, materials are synthesized uh, across the, the fields of uh, fields of uh, physics, chemistry, and material science, etc. Right. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, well, I believe a lot of in, uh, universities have lives. <laughs> you get access from the university. No, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so this is just an example of the, uh, the um, how, how you can search for it. Uh, a given material, you can uh, uh, look at the uh, chemical composition and uh, perhaps the, the symmetry information as well. Right. So uh, here I just wanted to show you some tools uh, we use to look at the crystal structures. So once you've uh, found your material in the um, in the um, in the search, uh, I would uh, really encourage you to look at look for the crystallographic information files, which is uh, the SIF files, right? So it's basically a text file that has uh, uh, all the information you need to know about the crystal structure, including the cell parameters and the space group, and uh, along with the the positions of different atoms in the in the unit cell, right? And uh, um, Right. And uh, uh, once you have this C file, which can be downloaded uh, from all the databases, uh, you can use uh, a few different uh, visualization tools to open them and play with the crystal structure. Um, and these are the two tools I uh, normally use uh, to look at those crystal structures. So you can uh, look at <coughs> certain elements uh, selectively and you can, for example, custom uh, define the range of bonds you want to, you're interested in. So if you happen to be performing a numer numerics, uh, numerical uh, simulations, uh, the SIF file is also uh, the starting point of a lot of the DFD calculations. So anyways, uh, it, it would be fun to play with the strict crystal structures and a lot of the, um, the plot I'm going to, to show you are, are, um, are generated uh, through, through um, one of the softwares. Right. So, um, as an aside, I'd also like to mention that aside from my so, so I'm I'm not advertising purely for <laughs> <laughs> so, so aside from my you would just look at, which was uh, actually uh, founded in around the 1970s. In the past decade ish, there's actually a growing number of uh, materials databases. Uh, hosted by different institutions uh, across the world, and I believe some of them are free. <laughs> I, I don't remember which ones. But, um, Do we all agree with each other? <laughs> uh, I don't think. No. I, I think on the on broad strokes, probably, but there there are are certainly uh, cases that they don't agree with each other. So uh, some of them, uh, uh, the materials project is uh, hosted by the Berkeley lab and uh, um, there's one uh, from Duke, one from Northwestern and one from NIST. And the materials cloud I believe is from a few different institutions in Switzerland. And there are also two from the, um, uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Right. So among these, uh, Right, so, so a lot of them are also multifunctional. So aside from the crystal structures, you can also uh, retrieve the uh, electronic structures and also predictions of, uh, of uh, some physical or chemistry properties, which we can uh, hopefully use to design our uh, crystal growth, for example. Right, so among those uh, relevant for, for what I'm going to talk about today, you might want to just uh, play around with the materials flatband database, which is, uh, is uh, partly from folks here at, uh, at Princeton. Right. So I listed uh, materials that hopefully uh, that has uh, uh, flatbands not so far from the front level. 
uh, at the DFT uh, from DFT. So um, it's uh, it's uh, actually an exciting um, a time uh, to see whether uh, how how the emergence of those uh, databases can accelerate our uh, material searching in, in in general. Right. So. Uh, here, actually, I want to show you one example of how we made use of those databases. And I, thanks to which um, I can give you some numbers of uh, how, how often you can encounter uh, flat band materials in actual crystal structures. Flat band structures, sorry. So, uh, and uh, this is uh, thanks to the, um, to the improved um, <coughs> interface of uh, some of those uh, databases with high throughput uh, searches. So, um, right, so those numbers I'm uh, putting out here is from this preprint I was uh, part, uh, I was partially involved with. So uh, what we did here is that uh, we uh, went into the, um, the crystal structure in the materials project and we extracted uh, the nat lattice network of all the elements uh, for, for the individual elements. And then we performed a very simple uh, S-orbital type mining model on those extracted networks. And uh, if, uh, they give out, uh, if they give rise to, to a flat band, we will, um, we will count uh, this as an entry in, in our uh, catalog. So, so basically, this is a way of characterizing uh, what are the uh, what are the um, flat man supporting lattices in 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 the um, in the actual crystal structures. So, um, right. So you can see that um, a kind of a considerable um, number of, uh, of materials would have a, a flat band hosting lattice in their, somewhere in their crystal structure. And uh, uh, the most uh, uh, frequently occurring, um, the most frequently occurring uh, flat band hosting lattice is the, uh, is the Kagoma lattice um, among, among all the different networks. And uh, uh, fo following which is the power, power claw lattice, which is a three-dimensional uh, version of this. And uh, uh, the next two are, are uh, two different uh, one-dimensional models, uh, which we call the stub and diamond chain lattices. Um, that's pretty common too. And then after that is the leap lattice we have seen um, just now. And uh, um, one can uh, work out that you know the amount that the top ten uh, most uh, frequently occurring um, lattice networks that gives rise to flat bands. So uh, about half of them are uh, line graph lattice, which uh, we label uh, with LG here, and uh, the other half is the uh, is the bipartite lattice with different numbers in these two sub lattices. So basically, um, the two different approaches we have seen in the first uh, section covers uh, what you need to know about uh, flat, yeah, flat band networks. Yeah, yes, Shogun. Yeah. yeah. So how does Goldberg's sample have a flat band after the surface? Uh, it's, uh, I think uh, most of them don't. <laughs> most of them don't. Most of them don't. Yeah. So, so we we didn't do DFT for for those. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, what I, the question is because of what the flat band near from the surface is really that we use the ability of crystal. So crystal want to reform to avoid the flat band. So but I wonder whether yeah, whether yeah. some example of flat band actually happens. Right, that, that's a that's a great point. Uh, maybe I'll show you some examples of this with them. At least near the first for me. Right. So I think I need to explore the bits. Right. So that, that's just uh, an overview of uh, how often you can find uh, flat band hosting lattices in, in actual materials. So um, uh, because the Kagome and Pyroclo lattices is uh, the most uh, frequently occurring lattices and 
most of the experimental progress up to now are, are on those uh, two lattices, and we're going to focus on those two in the in the following. Right. So the carbon lattice, um, actually, the the study of the carbon lattice based materials in condensed matter has the has a role, has a not so short history, and it was uh, first motivated by the search of the quantum spin liquids, uh, where the localized electron on these um, uh, copper two plus ions in, in this particular material uh, would support a very strong magnetic frustration and uh, leads to, uh, to the realization of uh, quantum spin liquid states. And uh, um, to look for the physics of flat band, though. Uh, we actually need uh, material systems uh, where the band picture has uh, has to be valid. So uh, we'll, we'll we'll be looking at materials that are very different from the more uh, from from the uh, the spin liquid insulating compounds. And uh, um, right. And this would bring us uh, to a very uh, different class of uh, emerging materials uh, called uh, carbon metals. And uh, uh, and this is uh, just a reminder of the nearest neighbor uh, type lining model of the carbon lattice. So uh, here I just wanted to show you some of the um, materials in the class. Sorry, it's a lot of crystal structures. So uh, um, the, the common place of uh, a common uh, building block of those uh, materials are this uh, carbon metallic carbon lattice of the transition elements. Right, so there are binary compounds between transition elements and the main group elements, uh, which can be tin or germanium and uh, maybe other main group elements as well. And uh, there are also a few um, ternary carbon uh, containing materials. Uh, and uh, you can introduce, uh, for example, charcoal atoms and uh, um, rare, rare earth atoms and uh, uh, Alkali and uh, nitrogen atoms in, into the crystal structure. Right. So because of the um, the carbon lattice itself has a few different interesting uh, features in its uh, electronic structure, including the flat band, the, uh, the band half singularity, and the direct uh, states here. So uh, depending on where the Fermi level is um, across the series, um, one could get a quite different physics. So in order to focus on the flat bands, we are going to look at the binary compounds in, um, in, in more detail. Let me skip this slide. So here, uh, I wanted to show you that uh, you can uh, find, find uh, flat bands in the AB plane um, in photo emission for two of the, um, the binary compounds two of the binary compounds uh, where uh, we have uh, um, the, we have a one-to-one -one ratio of the, of the, um, of the transition element and, and the main group element. And the crystal structure is such that um, the, um, the, the carbon lattice uh, of the transition element is, uh, is uh, stacked across the space layer that's composed of a honeycomb lattice of the, of the main group elements. Right, so uh, you can see that uh, there are um, flat bands uh, near the formal level in, in photo emission in the, um, in the AB plane. Right. So uh, let's also uh, take a look at the, um, the weight function of, of the flat band in cobalting in this case. So the crossing is more than the Fermi energy. The crossing between uh, the, uh, the, the, band the, the flat band is not yeah. that for in those two materials now. Yeah. yeah, that's why we can see them very clearly mm -hmm. in photo emission. Um, right, so, so this is uh, sort of the uh, one year wave function um, of, uh, of the flat band here. There's actually some tricks you have to do to, to, to make this wave function because if uh, so, um, because of the topology of the band, actually. So, uh, but more or less, the uh, the um, the essential idea here is that um, you have this hexagonal loop state, uh, which is similar to what we saw earlier uh, in hexagonal loop state of uh, three orbitals, 
and all the, uh, the orbital has rotated as you uh, go across the loop. And it's, uh, it's a sort of a de orbital version of the uh, destructive interference we looked at earlier um, in, the, in the simpler S orbital model. So, um, and pretty much this is a, a, a de orbital generalization of the of the um, S S orbital um, model we looked at uh, in the in the first um, in the first section. And uh, um, so not only you can see those uh, flat dispersions in the uh, in the photo emission. Um, which is one of the mo uh, more direct uh, experimental probe of the electronic structure. You can also see uh, those uh, uh, those uh, flat bands as a as a as a peak of the density states in tunneling spectroscopy. So here is um, one um, one example of uh, tunneling spectroscopy on the iron thin uh, thin films. That's uh, from the that comes from the short key barrier from the substrate. But uh, the, the key here is that you can see a peak in the DIDV um, as a function of bias voltage. And it corresponds, uh, and the peak here corresponds to where uh, you have seen, we have seen the um, flat band in the photo emission. And uh, um, right, so, so you can you can see, see this, so it's a, it's a different way of uh, um, experimentally uh, capturing the, the flat bands. So, um, so more recently, uh, staying with the uh, with uh, binary, uh, staying with the the binary uh, carbon lattice uh, materials, uh, we have been focusing on. Um, on uh, um, on the material of the family uh, that um, has the three to one uh, composition of the transition element with the main group element. And uh, it's uh, the two carbon layers uh, stack right on top of each other. Um, right. And in the DFT, uh, there's a, a pretty flat uh, electronic band um, at the Fermi level, and the bandwidth is around 60 milli electron volts. And uh, we've seen pretty um, uh, unconventional transport behaviors. So uh, that will you about the carbon lattice. And uh, yes. Uh, right. So so uh, I I didn't have the picture here, um, but um, it's a. Uh, so th this but th this band comes from the DXZ and DYZ orbitals. So in the plane, they have a reduced uh, dispersion, but out of plane, there's, the dispersion actually comes from um, the form of the D orbitals. Okay. Um, <coughs> so uh, so far, we've been looking at the 2D carbon lattice and their uh, the corresponding materials. And now let's uh, switch gears to its uh, three-dimensional cousin, uh, the paraclo lattice. So for the paraclo lattice, there's actually a very similar thread of um, history in terms of uh, uh, the research interest. So uh, the paraclo lattice containing compounds was uh, extensively studied um, in the context of uh, magnetic frustration as well. And this is an uh, spin ice. Uh, the, the Spin ice um, example of uh, spin ice, where you can have this highly highly uh, frustrated um, two in two out states um, on the on the insulating uh, power claw lattice containing materials. But um, again, uh, we uh, in order uh, to study the, the band physics, right? We wanted to uh, to move uh, to materials where the band picture actually holds. So there's a um, pretty well-known class of uh, compounds you can uh, turn to for the uh, for a particle lattice, which is this uh, C15 lattice phase, uh, which has the composition of AB2, uh, where the B element um, 
I mean, this uh, structure would form a pyrochlor lattice, right? So it's a it's pretty um, well studied. Uh, it's a it's a material class with a long history, which we first uh, study. Uh, yeah, believe it or not, it's about a hundred years ago. <laughs> and uh, here on the right uh, is uh, I just wanted to give you a rough idea of uh, what kind of elements can be available to form the um, from this lattice structure. So for the A site, uh, you can take um, the rare earth and uh, the Acoly metal and acoly, uh, acoly earth metals. But for the B side, it's mostly um, it's mostly um, concentrated in the in the transition uh, metal element part. So uh, very recently, uh, there are a few uh, reports of uh, on the uh, pyrochlor lattice. Uh, this study of those lattice phase compounds in the context of uh, flat bands. So uh, this is one of the um, one of the compounds where uh, we have uh, the the chemical formula cerium ruthenium two. So uh, basically, the ruthenium atoms would uh, would form the the pyrochlor lattice, right? And uh, and from the DFT, uh, roughly speaking, the the cerium um, F state uh, the the um, the electronic states near the Fermi level are uh, composed of the ruthenium states, and uh, and uh, there should be a flat bands derived from the uh, the pyrochlor network of the ruthenium atoms, and uh, uh, this is a um, recent ARPA study that's um, from from the group of Mingyi at Rice, and uh, you can see that uh, there are uh, flat dispersions which. Um, there are flat bands that does not depend on both the uh, in-plane and outer plane uh, crystal momentum. Right. So uh, basically, those are uh, three-dimensional flat bands, and uh, they, they are seeing that uh, they are capturing capturing it in the um, in, in the photo emission. So another interesting aspect of uh, about this material is that it's known to be a superconductor, and uh, uh, in the nineties it was. Uh, through mu SR experiments, it was reported uh, that there might be some magnetic components in the superconductors. So, so perhaps um, the flat band is playing a role here, but uh, I think a lot of uh, those uh, details ha haven't been figured out. So uh, because uh, this is such a rich, um, uh, rich structure with different combinations, so perhaps uh, it's a, I think it's really interesting uh, to to have. Get more systematics of, uh, of uh, how how the um, the pyrochlor lattice driven flat band um, exists in this material system. So oh, five minutes. Okay. Uh, so this is the last thing I wanted to show, and then I'll, I'll conclude. So um, here I, I'd like to just mention the field. I I have much less expertise on, but I think it would be. Um, interesting to, to platform to study the lattice driven uh, flat band physics uh, in so this falls into the um, the the, uh, the field of uh, organic chemistry and uh, you can um, you can make lattices uh, from the um, metal organic uh, framework of covalent organic framework and uh, even hydrogen bonded organic frameworks. So uh, there's a, uh, a lot of richness in the structure and there may be um, a lot of richness in the structure, although it's uh, pretty challenging to, to grow those, uh, those uh, materials in, uh, in very large sizes, but um, it could be an interesting direction uh, to, um, to allow us uh, to uh, realize Flat band hosting lattices. That's that's not very easy to find in more traditional uh, inorganic materials. So uh, with this, I'd like to um, conclude uh, this lecture. And uh, yes, um, I'll, I'll just stop here and uh, and uh, um, take some questions. I know we uh, yeah, I know we want to go to lunch. But <laughs>
questions? We have some from the webinar. Yeah. Uh, so, so there's a question regarding uh, like the bank structures you're showing the payroll part, uh, and the question is uh, 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 like all the bank structures. Then uh, yes, uh, this uh, is true for the like all the line graphs in the like the. Um, I mean that there's no. Yeah, I guess this question is yeah, sort of asked by some, some other people in the audience as well. I think um, if you lower the symmetry, for, for instance, actually, um, you know, the, um, so this is a, this might be a good example of answering this question. So this is a uh, breathing carbonyl lattice. It's a deformed line graph in some sense. And, uh, um, you know, you still get the flat bands, and uh, uh, the difference here is that you actually open the gap here from at this direct point. But somehow, the flat band physics is still still good. up to some modification to the line graph lattices. Yeah, and uh, yeah, this might be a like, more mathematical question, but uh, is there a condition of uh, Oh, a structure to be a microf. Um, I don't. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe there's someone in the audience who is can answer the question better than me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the last question. From Loom is regarding mm -hmm. the Penrose lattice. I think you already like briefly talked about the difficulty, but uh, can one define the like the band structure without the transformational symmetry? Um, I guess there's some opinions from the audience. Probably not. Um, oh, yeah, there's a... Okay, you have some example with a two-dimensional slide band here. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether uh, how many of them have with the bundles. It's bundles here, so the coupling are weak and kill them all. Since uh, those material and you put on the other substrate, this was um, a lot of freedom to to pull. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great question. I think I, I'm aware of one uh, material. I, I didn't uh, have a crystal structure here. So there's one um, material with the uh, niobium 3 chlorine 8. So it sort of has a um, breathing carbonyl lattice. And uh, um, that, that would be the, the, the Van der Waals material uh, so far, so far. For, for studying those physics. I, I think so theoretical is correct. Like the experimental difficulty is that a lot of the systems don't have the flatbed at the formal level, so we haven't. Uh, um, you need uh, you need the flat band to be at the front level for the instability to take place. But theoretically, I totally agree with you. Flat band ferromagnetism is a is a um, strong candidate for what will happen at the other front level. Yes. Okay. So, so in the flat band system, the interaction and play. Uh, an important role. So, do we expect the mm, actual spectrum we observed in those flat band systems are lower cover band that the on site repulsion is so strong that the, the ground state may, may only be occupied by one electron? Um, uh, in certain cases, uh, probably yes. I, I, would, I would say it's a case of. Okay. 
is it possible to measure that from the experiment? I mean, the um, I, I think certainly you can probably see those in tunnels and such. Okay. Just so, do you see two flat bands? Which one? Operates? No, no. Okay. So, so I think we are still in the single um, <coughs> single particle. Single particle. So far. So far. Uh, we all want uh, to go for a long time. Thanks a lot.